speed, and that makes the person really think about it. NASA test director, this is Ice Team, channel 232. We're complete on the FSS 215 foot level. Everything looks fine. If I'm comfortable that we've conducted this process in an orderly manner and that there's nothing out there that's bugging anybody, then it's fairly easy to give the go ahead to launch. At T minus nine minutes, the ground launching sequencer of the space shuttle is activated. During every moment of the orbiter's journey, sensors and instruments located throughout its structure are feeding its computers vital flight information along 3,000 kilometers of wire. By now, the computer programs that will launch and control the flight have rehearsed the mission more than 10 times. And for the past three years, programmers have been at work refining the programs, modifying over half a million lines of instructions. T minus one now. 31 seconds before launch, the computers take over the countdown, making over four million decisions every second. Endeavour's computer is now controlling. Seven, six, main engine start. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, and lift off of the space shuttle Endeavour, observing the changes of planet. Main engines create acoustic shock waves so powerful their vibration would be enough to shake the shuttle apart before it ever got off the pad. To dampen these waves at the exact moment the engines reach full thrust, 300,000 gallons of water are released into a trench below the shuttle. vapor and exhaust fumes blow out more than two kilometers. As the shuttle accelerates, massive stresses build up on its light aluminum frame. To prevent it from disintegrating, the main engines must be throttled back until the shuttle reaches thinner air in the upper atmosphere. When pressure reduces, the shuttle opens its throttles, rocketing towards space at 4,800 kilometers per hour. Two minutes from launch, the solid rocket boosters burn out and fall towards the Atlantic Ocean. Eighty-five kilometers up, the sky goes quickly from blue to jet black. Traveling at 27,000 kilometers per hour, the raw and tremendous g-forces of the launch suddenly vanish. This is Miko, main engine cutoff. As the spent external tank falls away, the astronauts are coasting in the silence of space. The orbital maneuvering engines are fired, setting the shuttle into a circular Earth orbit. Now, the real work begins. Once in orbit, the shuttle crew opens the payload bay doors. Open to space, the cargo bay becomes the workplace of the orbiter.
Some payload work is accomplished without ever leaving the cabin. You simply look out the rear window and activate the remote manipulator system, a 15-meter remote-controlled arm. Grapple fixtures and closed-circuit cameras ensure accuracy. After grappling a satellite, the crew must release it with great precision so it can enter its own orbit. The pilot must carefully fire the reaction control thrusters to get out of the way, and the crew must brace themselves. In orbit, the shuttle's pilots slowly maneuver the ship along three axes, using a combination of the 44 reaction control jets and the two orbital maneuvering engines. All orbiting maneuvers must be precisely calculated to control trajectory, carefully balancing one jet thrust against another. Inside the shuttle, an atmosphere identical to that on Earth is maintained and filtered every seven minutes. The payload bay doors double as giant radiators, and inside the temperature is a comfortable 68 degrees, despite outside fluctuations of 200 degrees Celsius as they travel between night and day. Below deck, oxygen and hydrogen are chemically combined in fuel cells to generate electricity with a useful byproduct, pure water. Some is jettisoned into space, the rest is used by the crew for washing and drinking. Everything takes longer to do when you first get up there, whether it be going to the bathroom or preparing and eating your meal or anything. If I were to drop a pencil, zero gravity, the pencil could be floating right here behind my head and I could spend, you know, minutes looking for it until some other crewmate says, well, turn and look, it's right there. Everything up here must be practiced. Astronauts have even had to learn how to eat. Today we're going to do a food evaluation session for uh, a couple of the astronauts, allowing them to try our EDO, Extended Duration Orbiter Rehydratable Food Package. Okay, um, what we recommend on opening the flip top cans on orbit is um, when you get ready to open them, you have to be careful in zero gravity. You have to be sure and rock it gently because if you jerk this lid off, you will sling product around the cabin. Are you doing something there, Bob? A tortilla can be flung like a frisbee, but a floating bean presents a different problem. In the end, what you can't find or eat you have to vacuum up. Oh, well. Oh, well, you got that hum there. Over your left shoulder there, right? They always use vacuum cleaners all over those vehicles all the time, trying to keep them clean. Because human beings, uh, their hair falls out, their skin falls off. If you had to clean the floor as, of your house as much as you have to clean the ceiling, uh, like we have to do in zero gravity, then uh, you'd see how troublesome it is to get everything. Though a vast bank of computers monitor and control the flight, each major system is being monitored at mission control in Houston by its own group of specialists. The orbiting crew will rely on them to provide the big picture. First row of consoles, people are going to be mostly worrying about the trajectory of the orbiter, where it's going, and if we're making the, the places in space we've got to get to. The second row of consoles is mostly going to be worrying about the systems on board the spacecraft. The third row is mostly going to be concerned with the command of the vehicle, the flight director, and overall decision, and the Capcom communicating with the crew. 